All right, so today, our purpose here together is to proclaim the name of our Father to be the highest, to be the greatest, so that our King may deserve the glory forever and ever. What a beautiful song. Do through the generations, that's what we will proclaim. Toldot means generations, and this is the generations that we are talking about, and we are one of those generations. That is to proclaim the name of the Father and to glorify His name. And as in the words of Mark Twain, he says, My father was an amazing man. The older I became, the smarter he got. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how we discover when we are young, we are full of knowledge and ideas and all sorts of things. But as we grow older, we realize that the godly values that our parents and we, we as parents know that everything that we instill into our children is not coming from goodness and mercy only. But we trust and we believe that the things that, we, that, that are from the Father and that we've meant for good and it's established by His Word and through His Word will be established in their lives so that when they grow up at some stage they will realize that what the Word has spoken is the truth and it will become a cornerstone of their walk. So... This is why on an annual basis, as we work through the, the Word with the guidance of the Prashot, we realize that these words that we are working through is like our parents guiding us, giving us guidelines and ways to walk in, the things that are for our wisdom. And every year as we walk through them and grow in them, so we discover that the Father is giving us more and more dimensions to walk a life closer and closer to Him. Because um, in this life, I think we are called to be changed into the image, to be transformed into the image of the Son as we're going on. And there's a lot of laying down of what we, are, that we have been walking in and believing and doing, and on the other hand, picking up the character traits of the Father. And this is what we are trying to do in our being together and walking and growing together. And if we have this foundation that we can grow in, then we are built on a solid foundation, like not on sand, but on the rock of Messiah. So that's what we trust we will do and grow together in. This is uh, today, um, remember when we spoke about um, Noah, Parashan Noah. It's um, I spoke about the ideas of of Simpson, Shimshon. You remember, man. And this young this young man is with me. Today's story of Isaac. There's such a close parallel to another revelation of who Shimshon was in his day. So I just thought we need to work through this and just spend some time and see what the father is doing in Isaac's life compared to what happened in the nation of Israel at the time of Shimshon. So, remember, at the time that Shimshon was raised up, Israel was in a difficult period of time. For 40 years, the, um, the Philistines oppressed them. So, why was Israel in a position that the Philistines oppressed them? Why were they there? What happened? That they were found themselves in that place. What do you think? What is the, what's the reason that uh, Israel was oppressed by Philistia? Because of their un own disobedience and sin. Remember in the book of Judges, the Father says, I am going to use these nations to make sure that you will walk in my ways and love my word and love my commandments. Okay? So if we see what happens in their life, it is because of the brokenness that exists within Israel and the Father's outstretched arm bringing them back to a place where they can be in close fellowship with Him. So, we find this real, these ideas, this parallel story. Now, on the one hand, there is a story of Toldot, which we are speaking about today, and Judges 13 to 17 that exist. And let me just read the parallels to you, and you'll f I found it amazing. It says that Israel, in the days of Isaac, 
And the, and the story of Isaac in Toldot not only speaks to his life, it speaks about his life, um, his wife, Rachel, Rivka, Rivka's life, and the two sons, Jacob and Esau. And it's all taken together in this parasha. So let's just have a, let's just quickly run through this. In these days, Isaac lived a life in tents. That's why when Jacob grew up, he was a complete man living in tents. That's where Isaac was. Israel was, in the time of Simshon, was in a time of being tested and judged by the nation of Philistia because they did evil in the eyes of our father. At the age of 40, Isaac was blessed with a wife. He married Rivka. That was brought by the provision of Abraham, Eliezer, and he went out and fetched the bride. We know the whole dynamic that happened there. In Simshon's life, Israel was given into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. There's a 40-year connection that's happening. Rivka was barren. Manoah's wife was barren. The difference is Isaac prayed for his wife so that she will have a child. Manoah didn't do that because it was a product of living in the life that Israel was living in the times of the judges. Everybody did what's right in their own eyes. So our father answered the prayers of Isaac and Rivka became pregnant and he sent a messenger in the life of Manoah's wife. She's never named as far as I know. And um, told her that she's going to fall pregnant with her son. Then in Rivka's life, there is a prophecy given to the mother, uh, to, to Rivka. You remember the prophecy? She had a troubled pregnancy. And um, so she was praying to the father, asking for a, what is the reason for what am I going through? And a, the prophecy was given to the mother, not Isaac, but to the mother. And the same happened to Manoah's wife. As a messenger came, and gave her a prophecy that she will have a son and he will be a life set apart for the purposes of our father. In Rivka, there was two nations in a lifelong struggle. Two brothers, but they represent two nations. In the life of Simpson, there will be two nations in a lifelong struggle. When Rivka received the prophecy, does it appear that Isaac listened to the prophecy, understood it, believed it with her? We just don't know, but that the blessing at the end of the day with Jacob and Esau doesn't appear to be the case. Did Manoah believe the prophecy, the word that the, that the messenger brought? No, he asked for confirmation. Remember, they prayed and asked for confirmation. For Rivka, a hairy child, Esau was born, one of the two children. What about Simpson? He didn't have his hair cut in his life. He was a hairy child. Two brothers that will have a long life uh, struggles is the destiny of Simpson and a struggle with the nations uh, in his area, the Philistines, but also with the Judeans. Remember the Judeans would, were disunited. They were fragmented and not living so much of a the life trusting in our father at that stage. And Simpson tried to bring them back into an understanding. In, in the life of Isaac... He went down to the place of Gerar and he said to Avimelech, my wife is my sister. So there's a little bit of a exchange in his, from his perspective that happened in his life. But what about his son, Jacob? He went to marry Rachel and he got Leah. There's an exchange for a wife and a sister that happened in his life. What about Simpson? Simpson married this, the daughter of a Philistine, I can't remember his name, and uh, he went away for a couple of, for a while. When he came back, uh, his father-in-law gave his wife to his, to Simpson's companion, and when that happened, he was slightly upset. And he, uh, caused some havoc, havoc in the life of the Philistines. But he said, the words that he said was basically that he has got a righteous reason to be upset with you lot. Remember? So it, Simpson's life was always a, a action that he set out to the Philistines, and when they responded, he had a good reason to to uh, judge them a little bit. Okay. So when Simpson 
this is a little bit out of time sequence, but at the end of his life when he was set up in the temple and he stood between two pillars, that word tzachak, it says he made, they said, they were mocking Simpson and said, you will entertain us. The word said Simpson made sport with him to entertain them so that they can tzachak, so that they can laugh. You know, they didn't laugh a lot, but it was the same word that was used as Isaac was doing the same thing with Rivka when Avimelech saw him outside of the window. And um, Avimelech said, what have you done to us? The same words are repeated by the Judeans when they heard what Simpson was up to. They said, what have you done to us? Now you've caused the Philistines to be against us. So when, when um, Isaac became successful in settling in Gerar and he planted his crops and he had a hundredfold return, that was the beginning of the vandalism side. It was the beginning of the problems of Isaac where they vandalized these, uh, the wells that he was re, uh, reopening from Abraham. And the same happened with uh, Simpson. When uh, when he heard about his wife, his father his father-in-law giving his wife his wife as a wife to his companion, he set fire to the houses, storehouses of grain, vineyards, olive trees, caused some significant damage. So, another connections are: How does Isaac respond between the three wells? We read it this morning. Between each well where there was contention, upset, what did he do? He doesn't react in violence. Remember, he never stands up and defends the wells, build a hedge around it and say, this is mine, it's not yours. He moves away to the next well, three of them. What does Simpson do? Every time that the, that the Philistines respond to his action, this conflict. So, when Esau, one of uh, the two sons, when he heard that um, Rivka and Isaac was irritated with the idea that, you, that Jacob shouldn't get a, a wife from the Philistines, he went out and married. Add to the collection of his wife, Philistines. So, what was the downfall of Simpson? It was a young Philistine woman called Delilah. Isaac was blind when he blessed his two sons. Shimshon was blinded at the end. Jacob had skin around his neck for the, when he presented himself, and so Shimshon was bound around his neck and his arms with bronze. Isaac asked Jacob to come closer that he can feel him, so that he can know for sure what was happening. Simpson asked to stand next to the pillar so that he can feel it. There's so many connections in these two lives. It's almost like it's a parallel story. How do, and the question is, how do you deal with your enemies? I think this is the basic question. Is from these two people's lives, from Isaac and Simpson's perspective, how do you deal with your enemies? So what will be the, the goal, do you think? How are we to deal with our enemies from these two lives? What do you think? What is what's the basic way of treating our enemies? What does Yeshua say? He said, do we love our enemies like Simpson loved his enemies? Or do we love our enemies like Isaac loved his enemies? Remember, Isaac was walking in a righteous way. He was a man dwelling in tents with the, with the values of Abraham installed in his life. And he came from a place of relationship with our father and responding to the people around him. In a certain way. Simpson was living in a time where Israel was already in the relationship with our father, was away from what, where they should have been. And now there is judgment and he stands up in a, mili in a military sort of a way. So I'm not saying what Simpson was, was doing was wrong. It was just a physical response to a military problem. Where Isaac was there to communicate the message of our father. It's two different focus, focuses, but I think it gives us a good perspective. So what is the purpose of Isaac and Simpson? Simpson was, as I said, living in a time of strife. Within Israel itself, there was strife, there was 
fragmentedness and there was disunity and uh, it was a time where everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And that uh, in that specific time, Philistia was raised up by the Father to attack Israel, to bring them back so that they can be restored in a relationship. He was a judge. Simpson was a judge that set out to conquer the enemy and in their common focus on the enemy, Israel can be united, Israel can be restored in the relationship, and they can start to trust on the, on the Father. Do we see some of those aspects happening in the world today? I think as Israel is reaching out together to a common enemy, Israel is being united, their hearts are drawn together, and their hearts are drawn to the Father. Do you think the judge's aspect of, or the judge's perspective of the word is still valid for Israel at today? I'm sure it is. So, uh, I think when I spoke about um, Simpson the previous time, we said that John, John the Baptist was making the way for Messiah to come. That's the confession that Yeshua had. If you read the word, it says that he was a voice in the wilderness crying out to make way for Messiah. Who did, who did Simpson make a way for? Similar story. What did, what did he do? Who reigned? Who came into, to, um, who became a judge after Simpson? Do you know? Shemuel. Samuel came. Samuel ruled for 40 years. After Simpson. And at the, and at the end of Samuel's life, when he grew old and his children had to take over, his children fell into the same trap that Eli's children fell into. And they weren't focused on the father. You can never, you can never walk in your father's shoes in terms of a relationship with our father. You must have a, a relationship with our father on your own behalf. They can't have a relationship on their father's behalf. And so they strayed, they strayed from where Samuel found himself. And the nation cried out to say, appoint to us a king. Samuel ruled for 40 years. How many years were Israel oppressed before Samson? 40 years. Then we get to the time of the kings. Acts 13.21 says, when Israel asked for the sovereign for a king, our father gave them Shaul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin. For 40 years he ruled. Who came after him? David. And in the days of David, he reigned over Israel for 40 years. Who came after him? Solomon. And in the days of Solomon, reigned over Jerusalem of all of Israel for 40 years. What's happening? It's amazing. Do you think the Father is trying to teach us something? How many days did Messiah go into the wilderness being tested? Forty days. How many years did Israel go into the wilderness? Forty years. It's amazing that we can see that the same patterns are repeating other throughout Scripture, from the beginning to the end. And I think um, the days that we are living in is prophetic days. We are living in days of prophetic fulfillment, but we must be careful that we don't run prophecy. We don't look at the events of the world and start to interpret Scripture in terms of the events of the world. Scripture must interpret Scripture. And we will determine the, the prophetic word to things that already happened. Looking forward is a little bit more difficult. Although, this, as Abby and myself spoke about this this morning, it's we need to have the word written on our hearts, so that when things happen in the world, that we can be wise and interpret it for what it is. One warning, don't listen to the news. Because the news always draws from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, never from the tree of life. So don't look at the news. Everything is going to agenda. It's the knowledge of good and evil. Let's look to the Father and live out the responsibility and the responsible that that the responsibility that the Father has put this group to function in the Southern Cape, let's do that successfully. James had this slide on some time ago, the walk, the 
path of faith, I think he called it. And there's a certain cycle in the life of Israel, in the life of the believing house of believers. Is there's a calling on their life, then they find a purpose, they walk and worship, and son, suddenly they are tested. And when they're tested, famine comes because they usually don't make it, and then they are taken to a place of exile. And because they're in exile and in great difficulty, they repent and they call out for the, to the Father for salvation, and they're restored back into a place of relationship, back to the land, and again they prosper. And when they prosper, the family turns to one another, against one another, and they start going down. And when, when there is disappointment that happens and testing comes, then if you look at this, you will see that there are famine and war. What are the four different judgments against the house of Israel? It's famine, war, pestilence, and the beasts of the field. The Revelation repeats that. All over the scripture it, rep it repeats that. And this is the pattern that Israel finds itself in. And we see this re pattern repeated in the time of Simpson where the house of Israel fell apart in disunity and in losing focus on the Father. And then time of great difficulty comes. Samson is brought to unite them. Samuel brings them back together. Saul takes them away from the Father. David brings them back. Solomon, uh, yeah. So, what is the ultimate purpose for Isaac? What is the ultimate purpose in the life of a believer? Who does Isaac represent in Scripture? The son, Yeshua. So, if we see Isaac, we should really look, because Isaac is an example to us. How do we deal with our enemies in times of difficulty? Remember, he was exposed to famine. Because in, in the days that Isaac lived, a great famine come into the, came into the place, and then he moved. So, what was his purpose that he was um, set apart for? To lead other nations to worship our Father. And that's our purpose. We are part of other nations. We come from, we come from other nations. We live in the south, southern Cape. Apparently, my great-great-great-grandfather was a Frenchman, loving wine. That's why my, my surname is Pinard. It's table wine, apparently. I don't know. <laughs> so, I'm from the nations. But I've been grafted in through faith into the olive tree, into the tree that represents the household of Israel. Okay. His ultimate purpose is to lead the nations that he found himself in, to lead them back to the ways of their father and, and present a light in the midst of the Philistines in this case. Okay? So, what is the main story that's told about Isaac? Remember Isaac? Isaac is presented as the son of Abraham. But we... Mostly we find all the stories are about Isaac. First, the promise. The whole story about the promise of the birth of, of the promised son is to Abraham and, and uh, Sarah. It's the whole dynamics of the messengers coming and promising the son and the faith that, they, that Abraham and Sarah took and everything happening and Hagar and all the rest of the missteps. It's not really about Isaac per se. Then we find the binding of Isaac. Who plays the main role in the binding of Isaac? Abraham. Isaac must just go along. You know? And what about the deception of Jacob and Esau? The deception of Jacob. All we know is Isaac, Isaac's vision sort of left him and the plotting of Rivka and Jacob and Esau, the, the, the lentil soup and all the rest. It's never really about Isaac. The only story that we know that's really told about him in the Torah is the story of the wells. It's dealing with his enemies. That's the only story we really is really about Isaac. So, he moves to Gerar. Where is Gerar? It is in the vicinity of the area that we today know as Gaza. Okay, he moves there. 
because apparently the famine that's, that struck the whole of Israel, Gaza escaped that. So, wonder why. Why would famine be over Israel, not on Gaza? What is the purpose? Sometimes the purposes of the Father is hidden to our plain sight. We can't imagine that. Isaac is walking in a way that that we know is blessing, blessing the Father. I don't think this ever is... No, no, it's Joseph's life. Isaac never goes out of the borders of Israel, and Isaac responds in obedience like a good son would. But he's tested. What will you do if famine comes along? Will you trust in the kings and in other nations? Or will you walk according to my way? So, Isaac goes to Gerar, to the Philistines, and he's a nervous man. You know, because he's got a beautiful wife. So he does this exchange of the wife and of saying that he follows in his father's footsteps. And that's a dangerous thing to do when your father makes a mistake. Because Abraham had a half-truth saying that Sarah was his sister. Because she was sort of his half-sister. Isaac didn't have that same excuse. And he makes a mistake. Avimelech says to Abraham, you're welcome to live in my land. My land is open in a time of famine that Abraham was tested. You're welcome to live in this land. You're welcome to dwell, to go, to, to just spend some time in my land. So, Isaac has a different experience. Because Isaac, the, I think verse 3 of that scripture says, I don't know if I've got a slide for that, says that... Um, the father says to Isaac, you will be blessed when you go down to Gerar. And when you gur, when you pass through it, you don't settle, you don't build houses, you don't settle yourself, you don't proclaim it is your land. You're a visitor in that land. You will be blessed. But in verse 6 of that same chapter, he says, and Isaac Shava, he dwelled, he sat. So Isaac had a, made a mistake. He proclaimed ownership of the land among the visitors that he's living in. So, so then we find that uh, uh, in this whole story, uh, Isaac presents his wife as his sissy, but in the meantime, they are playing. I don't know if they're playing dice or what they were playing, but they were playing. And... Um, in 26.11, he says, uh, Avimelech says, when you come to the realization that Isaac and Rivka was husband and wife, he says to the people around him, his nation, he says, if you molest Isaac, you will die. We honor Isaac. Remember, uh, Avimelech has got some experience with this story. He had already had the same story as Abraham. So there is a measure of peace between Avimelech and Isaac after he his relationship with Rivka is found out. But the wells is going to be a problem. That's why the story of the wells are there. So in Gerar, I think verse there, there's verse 3, that's a surprise. It's hot off the press. It only happened this morning, so I can't always remember what I've written. It says, Sojourn. A father says to him, Sojourn, Gur, in this land, Ba'aretz, Chaze. So he says, spend some time there. Remember, you are just passing through. But in verse 6, he says, Vayeshev, Vayeshev, and he dwelt uh, in Gerar. Isaac dwelt in Gerar. So, so, and because of that, what did he do when he dwelt in, in uh, Gerar? What was the, one of the first things that he did? He, he re-dug the wells that Abraham dug in the same place. Because he remembers what, uh, what his father went through. But the problem is he sowed the land. And when he sowed the land, the father blessed him. Because if, um, remember, ownership of the country, the, the Aretz of Israel, is given to, uh, to Isaac. But was it for then, in his lifetime? Was it for his lifetime? Remember the prophecy that was given to Abraham. It's the good news to Abraham was that your children will return and they will possess this land. But it will be a couple of hundred years later. For now, we are 
enjoying the land and touring through it. So, he had a hundredfold harvest, and uh, James read that last week. Apparently, the Afrikaans is prettier. Says he became great, and because he sat a lot, he became greater until he was very great. So, it happens, I know. So, when was this, when was these wells closed up of Abraham? Before or after Isaac came there? It was before because he redug them, he opened them. And, um, why would they be closed up? Because remember, it's, it's not a well watered place. It is an arid country. They would appreciate the water. Every well that produces water is a welcome well. Why would they close it up? Because remember, it's their piece of property at that stage. And they are the owners of that piece of property. And if you dig a well, and you say, this is my well, and you start planting crops next to it, then you're proclaiming ownership of this, of this place. And that became a problem. Wells, wells represent ownership of the land. Was Abraham in conflict with Philistia, or was he living there in peace? Was he living there in peace? It never says that he had conflict with. The word never see, never say that there was conflict between him and um, Israel. But what did what did the reopening of these wells mean to the Philistines? It says we are here to stay. And by the way, we are making more. We are our crops is way better than your crops. And they became envious, and they started to act in a, in a violent way. But I was wondering, Abraham, never, it's never recorded that he was in conflict with Philist, the Philistines. What, what names did Isaac give to the wells? The wells that, uh, the names that Abraham gave to them. But look at the names. Isaac, contention. Sitna, hatred. Do you think Abraham ever had Conflict in these places definitely had because the word says, and I read it last night. I don't think I made a um, I made a note of it. Unfortunately, the scriptural reference, but it says that the people of Avimelech started to respond against him digging the wells and being violent against him. And Abraham went to Avimelech and he told him what was happening. And Avimelech said to the people, "You would calm down." So uh, uh, Abraham never responded otherwise as to Avimelech. So 2619, Isaac's servants dug in the valley and they found there a well of sp- Maim Chaim, a well of springing water. The words are Maim Chaim, first mentioned in scripture. It's the first place that we find uh, living water. The herdsman of Gerar is very surprised. Never saw Maim Chaim. And they strove for the Isaac's herdmen, saying, The water is ours. And he called it Ezek, because they contended with him. And another well. They strove for that as well, Sitna. And uh, so, what was Isaac's way of response? He always moved away. He moved away. He never pulled up the 318 men of Abraham and made war with the Philistines. He dug another well, and for that they strove not, and he called the name Rehoboth and said, My father made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. So he withdrew from the area of Gerar. Verse 23 says he went up to Beersheba. Beersheba is the place where Abraham went to after he left um, Gerar, the land of the Philistines. So he's following in his father's footsteps, definitely so. What is the wells a prophetic picture of? Three wells, three temples. What happens to the wells? The first two wells are contended. The neighboring nations destroy both. What happened to the first two temples? The neighboring nations destroyed both. What about the third well? Rehoboth. It says our father made place for us, made space for us, and they were fruitful. And that one was never contended for. 
So, the important thing of this is, the third well was dug and remained open because he had peace with the neighboring nations. Do you think Israel is ready to dig the third well, the third temple? It doesn't appear that there's a lot of peace at the moment. But every war has got one thing in common. Eventually peace comes. So, we don't know what will happen, but what we do know is there will be one that will build when Messiah comes. So we are in a desperate war at the moment. I don't think it is the perfect climate for building a temple. And by the way, I, I said to you last time that we gathered that um, there was a... a um, in Israel365.com and in the Jewish voice, there were two witnesses of a senior rabbi in Israel that contacted was was contacted by the Italian parliament and said that they were artifacts from the temple that is welcome to come and have them and bring them back because you're ready. And that was a half-truth, it appears. Because uh, this week there's another article that came out and said that although there are truth in it, remember the Italian parliament has got nothing to do with the Roman order. They are a country unto themselves. And the Italian parliament cannot dictate to Rome what they should and shouldn't do. And um, But they don't anymore as what they used to deny that they do have them. So it's a step, step in a direction. The timing is not right, right now. So, I'm sorry for spreading false news. I was wondering if that is truth. I checked it the best I could. Apparently, not good enough. So, the fact of the matter is, there will be a temple built, not in the days of David, but in the days of Solomon, when they were peace. So, 26 verse 15 says, All the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father the Philistines had stopped and filled with earth. And um, the Philistine says to, to Isaac to go. It's mightier than what we are. What's important in verse 26 verse 17 is, he called them by the names after the names which his father had called them. So, so the way Isaac responds to Philistia is the same way that Abraham responded. Although there was contention and hatred and whatever, he responded in the way. And what was the end result of his, the way that he responded? Remember Isaac's calling is to spread the light of the word and the goodness of the Father to the neighboring nations. The nations that will bless you will be blessed, the curse you will be cursed. So don't put them, don't, don't go and cause them to hate us. Bless them so that you will be blessed and that the glory of the kingdom will be spread. So, from that period, 2613, when he became great, we know that there was contention. Because we see in the same story in uh, Exodus, in Egypt, just compare those two verses. It says, the man grew great and went forward, and it was very great. In Exodus 1, 9, he says, Pharaoh said to the people, See, the people of the children of Israel are more and stronger than we. Verse 14 says, And he came to possessions and flocks and possessions of herds, and a great body of servants, and the Philistines envied him. They were envy. What happened in Egypt? Come, let us... Pharaoh says, let's act wisely towards them, lest they increase, and it shall be when fighting befalls us, they shall join our enemies and fight against us. They were envy and fear. Every time that Israel is in exile and they are becoming stronger, focusing on the Father, same story happens. <clears throat> so we see that, that in the time of Simshon, just to return to his story for a short while, as uh, he was a conqueror, the word says he killed more people with his death than in his life. So, in his life there was a certain pattern. He reached out to Philistia, they did something, they fell into the trap, and he responded. He created opportunities, and those opportunities gave him reason to attack the enemy in a righteous way. So, 
But he was set on uprooting the enemy and freeing Judah from their oppression. This is a military strategy that we see in the world uh, even to this day. And on the end of his life, this word, Chazek, says that he entertained them in the temple and uh, killing the Philistines. So, not much entertainment, I would think, but this is what it is. How did Isaac live out his life as a conqueror? Was he a conqueror? Did he conquer to conquer? So, the question is, what changed between the well of Sitna, the second well, and the third well? There was something that happened. When did Isaac build an altar to worship a father? Between those two wells. That was the first time that Isaac built, a, built an altar. The first altar he had a, another experience on. The altar was built for him. For him. This one he built on his own. Verse 3 says the same story. A father instructs him to sojourn, and he sat and he became great. It was, I think this is almost like we've seen this slide again before. But the wells that he was digging was meant for a blessing for him. But he could also bless the nation around him. You agree? So if the, if Isaac's, um, intentions and everything that he did was there to bless the people around him, do you think it would be a good message to the people around him to say, come and share the water? And we can grow and live and dwell together. The Philistines didn't really see it, sir. And when he withdrew from the area of the wells, that same, that same word, Vayetek, is mentioned in the life of Abraham that says he withdrew from that place. So, at the end of Isaac's life, we can see that he doesn't hold on to the land because that's his security. He holds on to our father. Because our father is the cornerstone and is the one that he stands on, uh, that he that he lives in and glorifies and give glory to. So that is, I think, in our life and in the and what we see around us is that as as soon as we start holding on to the promises and to physical things around us, we're in trouble. I think uh, we should always hold on to the promises of our father and to him alone. That's more or less the focus. So, what was the wells? I think um, the relationship, as we say, was a little bit strained with his neighbors, and it became when he, he uh, uh, took ownership of the land that he was uh, dwelling in. And uh, as we see the relationship unfolding, we can see that uh, Isaac, his heart is changing. Heart, Isaac's heart is changing to worship the Father and trust in Him more than his experience in the field. So, this is an important thing. What significant event occurs between Isaac and Avimelech after building an altar to Adonai? What happens between, to, between Avimelech and Isaac when he built the altar? What happens? They make a covenant. And they say that we will not be aggressive to one another and we will live in peace with one another. And when this happens to Israel and its neighbors, they are ready to dig the third well. In this day today, Israel, to be a shining light to the nations around, must first sort out the heart of Israel so that they will turn to our Father and worship and glorify Him alone. And we can see that happening. Look at the events that's happening in Israel, people's hearts are joined together and they are fo focusing more and more on our Father, worshipping Him alone. And, in, and when that happens, then the purposes of what's happening in Israel is accomplished. Because remember, the Father brings the nation of Philistia against Israel for a purpose. And the purpose is to change their heart, to change their lives, so that they will focus on our Father alone and to work, to walk in the ways that our Father has laid before them. And when peace comes, then we are ready for a temple, for a well to be dug. So,
interesting thing about um, us walking in the ways of our fathers, of our father, and in the ways of our heavenly father, is that typically in the life, look at the people that sit around you. I reckon a huge percentage, a lo- the larger percentage of any faith group is people, mature people. You know? The, the <laughs> because, because as we mature and life, we've lived life and we've seen the values that is in the world and proclaimed, we remember the values that our fathers and our mother has instilled in our life if we were blessed enough to live in a Christian beautiful home. And then we return, make, we make Teshua back to the Father and we search and we look for Him and that's why we are here. And this statistic is, the statistic in the world is the greatest portion of a belief, a faith group is usually mature people. Of our age, no, let's, let's not. The statistic is against us. It's of a higher age group. But our, our, um, challenge is to bring our children in from a very young age. If we can instill life values, biblical life values from a very young age, that statistic can change. Because we are challenged to change that statistic. That word, that has implication on our lives, is to take our children from a very young age and raise them up with us so that they don't have to go away from what we have taught them as very young children and come back in later years and miss out a huge chunk of their lives that they have spent in the world. It's not necessary. That's the world's way. But in the way of a, fo- of a fellowship or a group, faith group, is to bring our children up from a very young age and keep them with us in faith and in fellowship so that they can grow up and to be the people that our Father has destined them to be. So, we are, and I think all of us has had this experience, as as we have rediscovered the ways of our Father in studying the Word and drawing closer into worship, as we can find the meaning and the answers that was laid before us from a very young age. And finding that answers is we see the foundation of the word that is uncovered before us and we can restore the house that we live in so that the house of the Father that's a light shining on a hilltop can be clearly seen. And this is the, the challenge that we have is to take these, the answers and the wisdom that our Father is instilling in our lives and transferring them to our children so that they can grow up in this challenging world full of lies and nonsense and and untruths and uh, i don't know if we if we are as successful as what we would like but we are growing in the right direction i think that is encouraging is that we are making a change so let's just see if we can wrap this up if we want to Proclaim a message. I think uh, Christian Andres and myself spoke about it this morning. If we want to install a message of peace to the nations, to the people around us, the light of the Father must shine in this group brightly. If we are able to be a light on a hilltop, then the light in our own lives must be uncovered fully. And we cannot, in a time of conflict and in disunity and whatever else can function in our lives, shine the light. So, And I think this is part of the reason why Israel is going through what it's going through, is to shine the light of the goodness of the Father in a time that their hearts are united and they, are, they can be restored. I said before that David wasn't allowed to build a temple because of all the wars that were going on. But it was built in the time of Solomon so that um, the message of peace and compassion can be given to the world through the hand and the life of Israel. In, Exodus, in Genesis 26, 19, the first mention of the Mayim Chaim, the living water, is mentioned. And in every time in Scripture that we see uh, the, that words, Mayim Chaim, 
It speaks about the living water of our Father, the revelation that flows from our Father to, to the household. So it's, um, if we've got the living water within us, remember Yeshua said that you've got rivers, streams of living water in, within you. So if we've got that streams of living water within us, then the drought and the famine and the dryness in the world can be restored. And I think this is um, one of the challenges that we have, is how do we influence, influence the people around us? Do, they, do we influence them with a Mayim Chaim, the living water of Messiah? Or what is it that we are busy with? Jeremiah 2.13 says, For two evils my people have, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, to hew out from self broken wells. And um, I think if we look at the evidence, the testimony of the world today in various ways, even in the, in the area of faith, we need to return to the Maim Chaim of the Father alone. Jeremiah 17.13 says, The hope of Israel is Adonai. All forsaking thee are ashamed, and my apostles in the earth are written, for they have forsaken the fountain of living waters. But I think the water, the living water is rediscovered. And I hope that we can be in the process that we are rediscovering this living water, and as the water, living water becomes part of our expression, we will be able to change the reality of where we live in. This is the mission of Israel too. Remember Messiah said in John, uh, John 7, 38, when he was on the last day, Simcha Torah, just the other day, October the 7th. Remember that day? That was the day when the, when the message of the living water in Israel was proclaimed. On the last day of the great feast. That's repeated in Revelation 7.17. It says that Messiah is in the midst of the throne. He shall feed them. And to the living uh, fountains of waters and wipe away all the tears that's seen. So the restoration will take place. All the heartache will be restored. And what, uh, what I think is happening is extremely tragic and heartsore. But in these days, we know the Father is in control and he worked, He's working His purposes in the earth today. We should rest in that. So, Zechariah 14.8 says, In that day, go forth, do living waters from Jerusalem. Half of them will go to the eastern sea and half to the western sea. The living waters will flow out of Israel. And I think that is the the Makor Ma'im Chaim is the hope of the living waters that will flow. And that's where we are trusting in. That's why we are called believers, is that the restoration of all things will take place. Yeah. I think as a young person, you think you know a lot. I'm not a young person anymore, it seems. When you get older, I said, Mark Twain said, the older I become, the wiser my father becomes. Apparently, the older you become, the less you know. Because as the wisdom of the father fills your heart to a certain extent, you reevaluate the things that you know, and you realize that a lot of the things that you know is not aligned with what the father's wisdom is. So then you should put those things aside. And even the interpretations and opinions that we have about the scripture, it is a small little flame. So, and we are trusting for the Father so that He will fill us with His wisdom and His insight. And as we get older and as we live in our days, and, as we, and this is a hope, I think, for our children, is that as we bring up our children in the ways of the Father, that they are set to walk in the ways of our Father, and that they are the light that they can shine in this world. As darkness is settling on the earth, the light will become great, and they will make a profound difference, even in our area. So the world view at the moment is that the answers lie in the future. Remember, we will find a solution to the problems. 
biblical worldview is a father knew the beginning, the end from the beginning. So we must trust in our father. At, if we watch the news events, I don't even want to do that anymore. If, you want, if you're watching everything that's happening in the world today, how does that support the biblical worldview? And the plumb line of our experience and where we are going is always the, the biblical worldview. Don't form opinions about what we are seeing in the news. It's hardly ever the truth. So, if we, and I think the challenge is, if we are grounded in the Word, grounded in the truth that comes from the Word, then these things in the world will blow over us and we will remain standing. So don't be too attached to what we hear and see and made to think and believe. We must be firmly rooted and grounded on the rock. And if we are there, we are in a very good place. In the days that Isaac lived on the earth, he could be overwhelmed and he could be swept away with emotions. I worked, I worked at a, at a tunny in this week. Now the tunny lives in an old age home. And, uh, so when I arrived there with all my good intentions, I got out of the vehicle and, uh, a slight little thingy. She wanted me to park there. I parked there because it's more practical there. I said, I will move there. And I got out of the vehicle and she said, that is the worst possible first impression that you could have made. And uh, whew. And the Tani and I had a little bit of a scuffle. And I said to her, Tani, if you want me to leave, I'll leave now. I'll just turn around and go. I don't have to do this. And um, so I had a Simpson and Isaac experience. I had a choice. What am I going to do? And the moment this thing started happening before me, I realized, you know, I'm preparing this whole thing this whole week. What is happening to me? Am I going to try to be Simpson or am I going to try to be Isaac? And you know what she, what she said just before we left? She said, me and my two guys that were, that were there, she said, if you want to be adopted, just come in and live with me because you were shining a light and you are, you brought me this miserable mood that I had this morning is gone and it is the greatest experience that I've ever had in someone being in my home. And I was actually surprised because um, what do we do with people that suddenly present themselves against you? How do we respond and what is the end result? If, they, if we leave, what do they remember? And, uh, yeah, it's difficult to be Isaac. Because remember, um, Simpson was a display of the power of our father, the givor of our father. He was a, he had, the father gave him physical strength to act against the enemy. And he used it with great success. What happened with Isaac? Do you think Isaac was weak? I wonder if I've got it here. What is, his, what is Isaac's greatness? He was a peacemaker that could de-escalate situations. And not only de-escalate potential aggression, but he can turn it around and make a positive impact on the relationship. It's the opposite of what Simpson could do. So Isaac, he musters the strength not to respond in violence. Simpson was a hero of Israel. He, he was responding in the gibor, the strength of Adonai. But Isaac had a display of the chavura, the restrictive power, which shows the kindness of our father to the people around us. So if we feel that we need to respond in strength and point a finger and shake a fist, think again. Just, just take a moment. Sometimes that is necessary. If Simpson responded in goodness and mercy and kindness, the Philistines would have run over him. There is a time for standing up. But the primary purpose of our father is not to be a Simpson, because that is in response to brokenness of Israel. 40 years. 
we are to stand up. And because the Father is instilling restoration and the foundation of truth and mercy and compassion and love in your life, you've been thoroughly equipped to stand up and be an Isaac. In every situation. And if you can't, you're going to be given the opportunity again. That's what happens. You know? So... Why are we here? There are two important days. The day that you are born and the day that you find out why. From that day you can make a difference. Not from that day. From the day that you find out why you are here. That's the day when you really can start making a difference. In your own life, and as an overflow of what's happening in your life, you can make a difference in other people's lives. So... We are here to shine the light of the kingdom to the people around us. To show the loving kindness of the Father. And when there is contention, don't re react. Don't react. Respond. Because if we react, it will be 90% like Simpson. If we respond, you took a moment, you thought about it, and you're given the opportunity to be Isaac. So, Isaac is not an easy guy to be like. That's why the Father gives us an opportunity to be transformed into the image of Messiah through our lives. It's not a natural way. That is putting down the flesh as we go and picking up what the Father is equipping us every day. And if you find yourself unnecessarily pointing a finger to someone who drives by you in a no, the Father will be gracious and give you that opportunity again to correct your mistake. You know? So, I trust and I hope that in this year, if we look at what's the, what happens in the world and what's going on in our own lives, and you see the brokenness in South Africa, and everything that's falling apart, and everything that's going to bits, that uh, we will have an experience of the grace that the Father is pouring out on us so that we can stand up as, an, as a body of believers and to be able to be an Isaac together. Because that is the way that the Father wants us to live and show His light, His compassion, His love to the people that surround us. And that doesn't mean Philistia has to run over you. What is the best possible way to conquer your enemy? The best possible way. Make him your friend. Not by, not by compromise, but by winning him with the love of the Father. Is that the easiest way to respond to your friend, uh, to your enemy? By all means, no. Because everything in me stands up and wants to fight to be a Simpson. I'm a little tiny Simpson. You know? But inside here somewhere, one of those guys exists. And our mission is to lay that down and to pick up our Isaac. Father, in our way that you are walking and that you called us to be, help us to live out your will and purposes in our lives. Father, impart your wisdom to us. I know you do, and you your desire for us is to live a life. To live a life shining and reflecting the light of Messiah in the world around us. Help us, Father, to experience that grace. Because you're, you're pouring out that love and grace over us. Help us to be able to reflect some of that back to the people around us. And to have the, the knowledge and the the realization that within us there is still some brokenness that must be dealt with, that wants to stand up and prove ourselves, to show ourselves to be strong. But help us to pick up your strength, your khabura, and everything that we do. Give us the discernment, Father, how to respond in whichever way 
to glorify you. So that life and love and restoration will come through our interaction with the people around us. Father, this is not the easy way out. This is not the way of escape. But this is the way to endure. And this is the way to conquer your enemies in the earth. Help us. Give us your wisdom, your insight. Help us, Father, with your love and your strength to walk in these days as a worthy ambassador of the kingdom. In the name of Yeshua. Amen.